Well, very good morning to you all. Happy Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us for Daily Devotions through Redeeming Life Fellowship. Uh, if you haven't met me before, I'm Dan. I'm a teaching pastor here. And I'm just uh, excited that we have this opportunity to get together to read God's Word as we continue to follow the Revive School reading plan that's been leading us through sections of the Bible. <clears throat> and today, we're going to be uh, actually uh, finishing up this year's section uh, that's been leading us through the Catholic epistles and the major prophets and the minor prophets and Paul's epistles. And it's been wonderful. But today uh, means that we're actually going to be jumping into a new genre, a new section, and indeed bring ourselves to the what is perhaps the most unique uh, book of the entire Bible, and probably one of the most unique books ever written in uh, human history, and that is the book of Revelation. And uh, perhaps you're interested and excited when you hear that we're, oh, we're going to be teaching about Revelation, and for others of you, maybe feel a little bit confused, perplexed, even terrified. Uh, I can empathize with both of those feelings, because Revelation is just a different type of book. And uh, and it presents a lot of unique challenges as we're trying to not just read the Bible, but to hear God's word, to hear him speak through a book like Revelation. And uh, and so, so reading and interpreting Revelation is actually pretty difficult. But here's the good news. Uh, the good news is, uh, for one, Revelation is without a question, one of the most theologically rich books, which is one of the reasons why I think we keep returning to it so often, not just because it's a really fascinating book, but that it's it's hard, actually maybe even impossible really, to try and get everything that, that the book of Revelation wants to say in one sitting. So uh, no one is ever going to get... Uh, uh, a complete or even firm grasp of it through one reading. It's going to take lots of revisiting and also a lot of meditating on what it has to say. In other words, our, one of our aims isn't just simply to read Revelation and crack its code, but to hear what he has to say and uh, let that message go deeply, as indeed it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So one thing that we, we have there, or a warning to us, the readers, is that there's it's possible that, that we could read through the book of Revelation and even grasp a lot of it intellectually, but that its message may or may not go to our hearts to where it affects us deeply and feeds our faith in God and Jesus Christ and informs our actions to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. So it's my prayer for you that as we read Revelation, that we we adhere to to the warnings and the encouragements that are written down, that we don't just uh, hear what it has to say, but that we actually take it to heart. So, with that in mind, I want to make just a few what I hope are helpful observations about the book as a whole, and then we're going to do a quick devotional on the latter half of chapter one. The book of Revelation what type of a book is it, we might ask? Well, technically speaking, the book of Revelation is kind of like synthetic material, where if you have a uh, a shirt that's, you know, vinyl and cotton blend, you know that in that one shirt you have mixtures of of a substance of one kind, a substance of another, that that because you've woven them together, you've actually created something that's synthetic, that's new, that's different. Because uh, what the synthetic can accomplish is more than just what 
the cotton or the, the vinyl can, uh, or is it vinyl? Polyester. Polyester is the word. Uh, more than what the cotton or the, the, the polyester can put together, but or do, can do on their own, rather. Enough of this talk about clothing. Goodness gracious. But because you've woven them together, you do actually have that something that's new and uh, something really even profound. So uh, Revelation is... Uh, it's, it's this blending, this tapestry weaving of at least three primary literary genres. And that the first one is apocalyptic, the second prophetic, and the third is a letter or an epistle. Uh, what we mean by an apocalypse, meaning that what you have here is not just a series of visions, but the visions together that really constitute an entire vision, where John is looking at a window into reality to be able to see all of the world, the cosmos, and human history through God's perspective. So that uh, the whole world looks different, not because that he can see it from his own vantage point on earth, but that he can see things as God sees them. And indeed, uh, see the sort of cosmic warfare that's struggling between evil and good and the role that the church is supposed to play in that. And through all of that, not just to see also that, that uh, Christ is indeed the victor because of his sacrifice on the cross, but that you can see the way in which what Christ has done actually secures, and indeed uh, it is God's hand working in human history to accomplish his divine purposes throughout all of it. So lest we would ever look at Jesus dying on the cross or a, a cross in somebody's necklace and say, oh, that's what Jesus is doing, dying for my sins. That is very true. Uh, but do we dare say that that's merely what Christ is doing on the hanging on the cross and dying for people's sins? But that it's not merely that, but indeed uh, the the picture of what God himself wants to do to redeem all of creation and to make it new uh, is happens through 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 Jesus Christ. So it's like our our picture or our understanding of who Christ is and who God is and who the Holy Spirit is uh, is not just uh, clarified but expanded. Uh, so in that sense, Revelation is very Christological and theological in that. Our understanding of who God is and who Christ is is expanded through reading a book like Revelation. Uh, the second, uh, it being prophetic. And it being prophetic is, in other words, God doesn't just have something to show, but he has something to tell. What God is communicating through John to speak to his church is indeed a message of relevance and indeed a message that God intends for his church to hear. Now, maybe you've had the experience before, especially with like a close friend, where you've been talking to them and they've been distracted by lots of different things and you've gotten to the end of your thought or series of thoughts and you were just distraught and frustrated because you had spent your time and your mental energies to 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 talk to somebody and to share your heart and your mind with somebody and they just weren't listening you 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 didn't have your ears and your heart open to what it is that the other person what, what they were having to say that's really frustrating isn't it when you have something really deep and personal and meaningful that you want to say to a friend and you know that they're not listening uh it's you, you can't have fellowship with somebody. You can't have a working relationship with somebody if you're not actually listening to what they have to say. So if, if the message of Revelation is indeed a prophecy, meaning that, that John is functioning as a mouthpiece for what God has to say, it must mean that whatever he has to say is immensely important. And that all of us, if... If we want to live lives that are meaningful in light of God's purposes for all of creation, we have to listen. 
to what John has to say. We have to listen to what God has to say through the prophet John. So, and lastly, this letter is an epistle. One of the things you'll notice at the front end is that it's addressed to seven different churches throughout uh, what is now uh, modern-day Turkey, uh, ancient Asia Minor, and by way of addressing seven churches, we happen to know that there's certainly more than seven churches throughout the, the ancient world at this time, but that it's a way of speaking expansively or collectively to the complete body of churches as a whole. But nevertheless, what you'll notice in these short epistles to these seven churches that are addressed in chapters two and three, that they're addressing particular circumstances that the, the churches themselves are dealing with, whether it's from Ephesus or Smyrna or Philadelphia or Laodicea or Theatria. Uh, it's addressing each of those because whatever it is that these churches are experiencing, they, what they need to hear, what they need to see is their experiences in light of what God intends to do so that they can be faithful through the, the trials and the circumstances and the persecutions that they themselves are probably experiencing. And what all of this means is that the churches are encouraged to see their life and their circumstances in light of God's purposes. So that when the, these churches see what John sees, the, the reality from God's perspective, that, and that they can see what God's purposes are for, for all of creation, that they can orient their lives and their ambitions and their intellects around the living God who is sovereign over all of creation and all of history. In that sense, Revelation speaks immediately to their circumstances. And indeed, it should imme speak immediately to our circumstances as the church today. So, uh, another few observations about, about uh, Revelation. It, the author or identifies himself as John. It's not 100% certain or clear which or John that the author is referring to. And... Uh, there's scholarly debate between who this John might be. And I'm still of the opinion uh, that this John who is referring to is John the Apostle. And that means uh, the same person who's behind the first, second, and third John, the epistles, and the same one who's behind uh, the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so that when Revelation, the, the author identifies himself as John, this is referring to the same John. Uh, I think that there's a, a, a very compelling argument to be made for that. And John, by this time, is probably writing in the late first century uh, and uh, under the reign of the Emperor Domitian, which uh, is important not per, not just for historical purposes, but rather to know that that there appears to be a heightening level of persecution under the reign of Domitian. And it's not merely persecution of the Christians, rather to say Rome hates Christians and so he wants to kill them all and to, to disband with them, but rather what appears to be on the rise at this stage is that of what's called the uh, imperial cult or the emperor worship. So in other words, what's demanded of Rome and its citizens and un the, everyone under the, the dominion of, of the Roman Empire, in order for them to, to live and to function as citizens under the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, that you have to do something more than just recognize her state authority, but that you have to burn incense to Caesar, to treat him as a god, to worship him, indeed make Caesar and his 
occupancy on, as the or in, in his role as the occupant of the throne of the reigning superpower of the day that you must worship him if you want to function and to, to experience the peace under the reign of the Roman Empire. And that poses a problem for a lot of these Christians who, who have been taught to say or to recognize that Jesus is Lord and it's not Caesar. And that to say that Caesar is Lord in this exhaustive, complete, sovereign sense is to accredit to Caesar that which only belongs to God. Remember what uh, when Jesus is in the temple and he's asked with a question whether or not it's uh, it's it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesars to, to Caesar, excuse me, and then uh, uh, Jesus asks for a denarius and he says, you know, whose image and whose likeness is on this coin? And they say Caesar's, and he says, well then, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's what is God's, and the logical question that falls on uh, uh, after that is that if you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, what is it that we give to God? And the logical answer to that is that whose image is on you? And that if you are bear the image and the likeness of the living God, that means you belong to him. And that by worshiping Caesar means that you are giving to Caesar that which is only rightfully, truly, wholly, and completely belongs to God. So, so that's the the circumstance that's probably pressing on the authors, the writer, or the, the the audience, the churches of what they are experiencing. And this temptation: Do I do what I need to do to survive, uh, even if it means the cost of my life and the shedding of my blood, just to? offer myself in worship to this Caesar, to this emperor, that which only belongs to God. And th this is one of the, <laughs> so fascinating, how this sort of thing is relevant for us today. I want to share with you this quote by a, it's a, a college football analyst, Joe Klatt. And he was asked for his opinion on why it is that these uh, college football coaches would leave midseason uh, in order to to uh, be coaches at bigger and more prosperous universities. And here's what he, he he said, because the problem, of course, is that that college football coaches spend uh, years and whole seasons trying to get the most out of their their college football players, inspiring them and and uh, preaching, loyalty, commitment, sacrifice, all for the, the sake of the person who's next to you, and then the next moment, just at the highest paycheck, leave and go someplace else, which, you know, is disingenuous. And you're like, you're, you're left wondering, uh, you know, did this person actually mean what it is that they had to say? Uh, and where it's it's apparent that the person who they're serving is not uh the 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 football team but rather serving their pocketbooks and this is what joe clatt had to say and it says he said this every one of us is for sale there's two reasons why that's not going to happen for you or won't happen for you that means being bought you're either not valuable enough to leverage that for sale or two you have some contractual obligation that prevents you from going in that direction. Cast the first stone if you are not going to move. And interesting that when he says cast the first stone, that's uh, a biblical metaphor that's borrowed from John, chat, well, from the book of John, uh, uh, in chapter 8. He, he without sin, you cast the first stone. And what's fascinating to my mind, when he when he says that, is that he knows, humanly speaking, that people will um, will sell themselves for whatever gives themselves the most profit. Which means that that there's a 
that that what's been washed away from from personhood it's a sacred belongingness to god and the belief that a a, a person cannot should not indeed must not um be reduced to a material good and um uh, and what's interesting about that is that the reason why Christians can, in Revelation, can uh, hold fast to the witness of Jesus Christ and his, uh, his sovereign rule and reign over the cosmos is because they've been bought. They are a redeemed people. Indeed, uh, it says in Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse... Five, uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. One of the, the, the issues, I think, at the heart of when we were reading Revelation is this question, who is it that we belong to? And how I live in today or and, and orient my life and is is dependent on whether or not I I realize or know who it is that I belong to in my heart of hearts. And so uh that's one of the things, another thing that is important when we're reading a book like Revelation. So thank you for your patience thus far. Now uh, a few more observations and then we'll get to the text. Uh one of them being that in Revelation it is, I would argue, more simple than you are led to believe, and it is also more complex than you're led to believe. And so, uh, when it comes to trying to interpret its symbolism, uh, to go into it, I wouldn't say with an open mind, but rather to say, uh, there's a weight or wealth of meaning within the symbolism that John uses that can be uh, sometimes very simple and other times very expansive and uh, and certainly open to interpretation, whether it's referring to evidence in the furthest remote past or to uh, events in John's day or events throughout church history or even in, in contemporary events. So uh, I would say... Uh, Go into Revelation with a teachable spirit. Uh, okay, the second uh, one is that there's lots of different views on interpreting Revelation, whether it's uh, a preterist view, meaning that uh, that all of the events are, are isolated contemporary events to John's day and that there's nothing more to look forward to in, uh, in, in the symbolism that, that John presents. Sometimes uh, people present the historical view that uh, what has been happening uh, has been unfolding at lots of uh, uh, periodic stages throughout human history. This is one of the reasons why, uh, say, during the Reformation, a lot of the, uh, it was a, a popular interpretation to regard Babylon or Rome as the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And so, the history of interpretation in that regard is actually very interesting. There's also a futurist view that looks at the uh, as everything that's that's happening in um, in Revelation as uh, projections all the way towards the future. And there, there's a lot of truth to that. And then there's also an idealist view that, and I'm borrowing all of these 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 subcategories of interpretation from Mu and Carson, by the by, but I digress. The idealist view, uh, meaning that these don't refer to any kind of concrete historical events, but rather they're uh, pedagogical. They're intended to teach ideals or theological principles that don't actually have any kind of bearing in human history. So uh, each of those views has... Uh, strengths and weaknesses, and indeed uh, legitimate places throughout uh, Revelation where where uh, it's a reasonable interpretation to follow in that in that trajectory. But what I would encourage you to do is to 
keep bearing in mind, I would say, a futurist view to, towards interpreting Revelation, particularly because it's the futurist view that is the most eschatologically oriented. In other words, it keeps our minds fixed upon what it is that God still insists on accomplishing and doing that uh, that gives us a view in the present how we should understand our present circumstances in light of the future. So there's that. Uh, another uh, hiccup, or I would say uh, one of the things that sort of bogs down the, the reading of, of Revelation are debates upon whether you are pre-tribulationist, mid-tribulationist, post-tribulationist, amillennialist, and uh, all of those, they're, they're interesting debates, but I would submit to you that there's not a tremendous amount of fruit that's to come from those, those debates, particularly because I do think most of the debates about where the millennium is and when it's going to happen, uh, that, that most of that discussion, I think, sweeps over and is, is very dismissive of what the authorial intent, that is, John's intent for writing this, needs to take priority over discussions about millennialism. Uh, and so I would say, uh, uh, bear in mind, let's, let your head sink really deep into the, uh, into the uh, epistle section, that is uh, chapters uh, two and three, and let that give you a picture about the purposes for why it is that John is relaying this revelation to the churches. Uh, and then lastly, as you'll know, throughout uh, throughout Revelation is that uh, it is very symbol laden. In other words, uh, it's it's not meant to be a literalistic interpretation of what's going to happen. Indeed, uh, just by references and usages of the mentions of, of Babylon, this ancient empire and enemy of, of God and his purposes, by the point of John's writing is nothing larger than a small village in the um, in the, the the far reaches of the Middle East, and that nobody cares about Babylon at this point. So it's it's he's not referring to literalistic interpretations, but that doesn't mean that what he is saying is not real, uh, indeed real in the truest sense that we can ever possibly understand it. But that what I would encourage you even if you're going through a slow reading of Revelation, and that if it's borrowing this symbolism, is to see what these images mean in light of their primary reference to the Old Testament. Revelation has far and away more references, allusions, and uh, borrowing of Old Testament imagery than any other book in the New Testament. Uh, it's like, as, as I've said before, it's like John uh, invited or is holding a party and opened the door and the entire Old Testament just showed up and comes crashing through. And we're going to get a, a picture as to how it is that that is, appears to be working, even in chapter one. So thank you for sticking with me so far in Revelation. So let's look at Revelation. And I would encourage you to read through all of Revelation of course, but to read through all of Revelation chapter 1. But we're going to take time and read together verses 9 through 20. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. So, Bryce, Faith, Luke, Glenn, B, Tom, Beth Ann, Brianne, uh, let's uh, sit down and, and listen to what he has to say. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom of and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, 
write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see that the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Take note on that. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. In other words, all of these descriptions are meant for us to, to look at Christ as God. Uh, indeed, when he shines in all of the attributes and the features and the glory that are characteristic of God and God alone, and you see Christ through those lenses that you know that, that this um, is meant to for us to inspire our, our worship and our devotion and our affections towards Christ, the living God. And that that is critical to understanding the rest of Revelation. And it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me, which, I pause, what he means by him placing his right hand on him is one where John is prostrating himself before the living God. And that by placing his right hand on him is an act of showing him favor and grace. In other words, John recognizes his unworthiness, his sinfulness in the presence of God. And even still in that moment that, that, that God, the living God, in, the, in his presence, his awe-inspiring presence, touches him with his grace. I don't know how that affects you, but it shakes me. Uh, so, and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Isn't it interesting how when, when John sees God and falls prostrate in his presence, that when he sees God in this beatific vision, the first command to John is to not be afraid. And I think it's true. There's a principle here is that when we see God as he is, we have every reason in the world not to be afraid. Indeed, if we, if we fear God, there is no reason for us to, to live in the dominating fear of anyone or anything else. Uh, and so, and uh, let's continue. Uh, verse 19, write therefore what you have seen what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The seven lampstands is a pretty clear and obvious illusion that takes us back into the Old Testament and the furnishings of the tabernacle and the temple where in the holy place where priests would come and minister before the, the before God, that there would be a lampstand with seven branches. 
uh, that would be let, lit and be perpetually burning to indicate or to symbolize this perpetual abiding in fellowship and relationship with the living God. And that's how, from this light, this apocalyptic vision, this seeing reality through God's perspective, is the role of the, the, the church in the presence of God. In other words, John and the church have a sacred calling. Indeed, in the same way that these lampstands were dedicated in service to the living God, that they too have this belongingness and this uh, instrumental purpose in light of the revelation of God. In that it's because of what they know and what they've seen and their function and their, their belongingness to God that they can endure what it is that they're about to endure. And indeed, uh, see to it through the very end and emerge victorious because of, of their abiding presence and relationship and fellowship with the living God. It's their fellowship with God that continues to set them apart, to make them a, a, a different, indeed, uh, a light to the nations, a light of the glory of God, that, that they can live differently because God has called them and if God has called them, that he's going to be the one who sustains them, even through this persecution. And so, let that be an encouragement to you, that when we worship God and serve him only, that action is a living testimony to who God is. And to do so at all costs, even at the cost of our blood and our life, is possible because we recognize our belongingness to the living God and that our fellowship with him is foremost in our lives. Uh, that there's nothing more important to us than, than abiding in living relationship with God. And so uh, the encouragement, I think, for all of us is not just to, to, uh, to be lampstands, as we'll read about in the rest of the epistles, but rather... Uh, to answer the call of that God has placed in our lives, that we remain faithful to God at all costs. And so uh, that is just, yeah, scratching the surface of revelation. And I hope that you continue following with us as we uh, uh, look at bit by bit and unpack it so that we can uh, get a picture about what it is that God intends to do with his world. And that I pray all of us would also draw nearer to him, that we would respond in the same way that the seven churches were to respond. Uh, and that is to remain steadfast, immovable to the very end, to worship and serve and love God fully and completely, uh, no matter the cost, because it was by his blood that he purchased us and we belong to him. So thank you so much for taking the time, this long time to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about Revelation. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't, do uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can de get daily notifications to follow along with the reading plan. And I'm looking forward to seeing you when we gather together in person, when we follow through with the, the uh, more devotionals, be them on Wednesdays or Thursdays or uh, Mondays, uh, indeed every day of the week. Uh, we just love being with you. So uh, God bless you. Take care. And may you continue to grow in the grace and the wisdom and the love and the glory of God forever and ever. Amen.